everyone, and welcome to the session, Gender Data, Knowledge Gaps, Research Protocols, and Improving Data Systems. This panel will explore the agricultural development community's efforts to understand and close the gender digital divide and improve gender data annotation and findability. Each panelist will present and audience members are invited to submit questions through the platform's chat box. Enjoy. Hi, and thank you for joining this session today. My talk is a little bit on women access and data just to set the stage for some of the other speakers. My name is Revy Sterling and I've been working at the intersection of gender data technology and development for about 25 years and I'm delighted to be here and will be part of the online chat when it happens. The gender digital divide is just one of these, you know, almost intractable issues. I've been working on it for, you know, a few decades. And honestly, the I've just seen the same mistakes and misgivings that keep happening again and again. Um, and people come in that are new to this space every few years, which is wonderful, but I feel like we keep doing a reboot. And the fact is that gender is cross-cutting across all of development, obviously, but certainly digital development. And it's hard to understand really what the state of the gender digital divide. GSMA, and you'll hear from Claire Simthorpe next, you know, does an amazing job with the, the data that they produce every year. But ITU has a different set of statistics and Research for Africa does and uh, Lineage and, and other organizations. So it's really hard to understand exactly what we're talking about with the gender digital divide. And I'll talk about that in a few slides. But really for me, this comes down to the root causes of the gender digital divide. And my focus both in research and practice and as part of the DNA of the Women Connect Challenge is really looking at the social norms that keep women offline and underconnected um, and, and, and underserved and underdeveloped uh, because they don't have access to the very information communication technologies that could really assist them in their lives and livelihoods and aspirations. Um, and that's part of what I've been really focusing on is looking at these gaps that can range from 14% you know, to some communities I work to to almost 100% in certain communities, even though there are always the, the outliers to that. So I'm going to go ahead and advance to just a quick piece of this is the kind of thing that, you know, this is the stuff that's been, you know, that people have tried for 20 years to move the needle in gender digital divide work, and it just doesn't working. I mean, one is how we are currently counting because we do have so many different standards and definitions. Two is just everybody's favorite thing, which putting, you know, putting a tech camp, a digital literacy program out there for women and expecting women to somehow become micro entrepreneurs and run the next Etsy. Um, you know, assuming that everybody has smartphones, and while of course there are more smartphones, um, most of the women I do see with smartphones have the very, very old generation ones that don't have the memory or um, the capacity to even run the applications that are being built. Uh, very low relevance content. If you look and realize that only 0.4% of the entire internet is in a language like Hindi with so many, you know, billions of speakers. Um, and, and then of course you have things the you know, low literacy for women, et cetera, you know, there's, wh why connect to the internet? Why would I spend my time and my money on this? And then what really comes down to is this lack of deep cultural context of how women are actually going to integrate uh, information communication technologies into their lives and what that data say about, those data say about their experiences online and, and, and what they, they say to their friends and family. So kind of on the flip side of this is what does work because a lot does work and there's been tons of research in this and the people that are on this call um, have, have done that research. Um, the major things that I feel are, you know, you have to work with those who are in power. You need the explicit permission of, of the, the men, the fathers, the mother-in-laws, the employers, the clerics, it's, you know, the, the, the power brokers in the community to even let women use technology in a lot of places. What I think is that really, you know, those women who can and want to have phones, then they fulfill two you know, fulfill two conditions there. They can, so they're able to have a phone, and they want to use it. They have phones. They have found a way uh, to 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 have a phone and to keep it charged and to use it for whatever they're using it for. So really, we're talking about the last you know close to a billion people who don't have phones, are mostly because people don't want them to. Um, 
a lot of communities think that you know, the internet is immoral for women to use. It messes with the status quo. You know, we've looked at this in other issues, you know, with child brides and girl children going to school and female general mutilation. The status quo is something that, you know, people hold on to really, really strongly, especially in a time of, of insecurity. Um, that's where the real interventions are. You know, why aren't we using the playbook for those? Uh, and, and instead we're holding a tech camp. Um, that's how you change the minds of the naysayers and the power brokers. Uh, because without their explicit approval, these women are never getting online. So we have to create those compelling use cases so that people who don't want women to be, you know, online. And in this case, you'll see a picture of a text-free uh, user interface that's uh, a social network that was created for very low literacy and low skilled women in Bamako slums to build this whole health based social network online um, so that their, you know, that their husbands and, and families say, absolutely, you know, we see benefit to you having that. Um, you know, when we create, you have to co-create with, you know, with the community, with the naysayers, with the power brokers, and of course the women end users themselves to come up with programs uh, that, that truly enable women to safely and accurately and, and excessively use technology. So the problem with the digital divide at large is we're actually creating a lot of problems while we're solving um, several problems. I look at the fact that we have so many digital strategies out there that every bilateral and multilateral has a digital strategy and that's great and I understand and, and, and encourage the fact that you know technology is now stretching out more and more into each of the vertical development spaces than being its own ICT for development sector. Um, but if you do move everything you know, to a smartphone, to an online platform, and women aren't allowed to access that, or don't have the confidence, or don't have the money, or don't have the skills, or just generally don't believe that technology is for them, you know, in the old days, they could actually, they could meet with the extension officer who came to town. They could meet with the community health worker. If it moves to the phone, we actually can, are creating in some communities a much bigger gender digital divide. So I can go through what works in, in much more detail with any way that's interested, but um, in the interest of time, we need to really kind of understand what do we need to measure and where. We have many different indices when we talk about gender empowerment. At the same time, we have a lot of growing and burgeoning indices in gender digital divide. Like I said, there's GSMA's report, uh, reports, uh, there's the ITU broadband report, et cetera, um, but they're all measuring different things. I'm not saying one org should lead this. I think that's absolutely crazy, but we need to refer to each other's data sets and understand the methodology behind them. Is it phone ownership? Is it mobile internet use? Is it smartphones? And where do smart feature phones like KaiOS run, you know, Geo and banana phones come in? What are people doing with phones? What are people doing online? Who is using the MAGRI and M Health apps? Um, does this money, does this capture mobile money use? Does it not? What about offline internet? Um, I think of things like the talking book or the fact that a lot of these feature phones, smart feature phones will be able to have an offline component. Uh, how are we capturing that? What constitutes digital skills? My, my the ITU stats around digital skills that only apply to a laptop or a desktop scenario, but not a mobile phone scenario. So, you know, everyone is working in this meaningful use, meaningful data space. I can name an org doing work in each of the things that I've mentioned, but we need to understand how each index measures the gender digital divide. You know, what countries, what populations. I work in small data. I know that's that's not sexy in a time of big data, but um, you know, in one simple, in one slum in, in Dar es Salaam, 30% of the women I work with have free access to their phones and 30% have to get explicit permission to use it from their husband or their father anytime they wanna use a phone. So we can get state data, we can get you know, more granular data, but what about these kind of data where we're actually in the community? Um, how do we build up all that small data? Uh, you know, GSMA does an amazing job of, of looking at the issues writ large with connectivity and accessibility, and you can, it's really interesting to layer their studies on each other. Um, at the same time, you know, they admittedly don't go into the real deep, 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 hard to access you know, rural or insecure communities, which is where I work. Uh, because to me, that's where the need is the greatest to close the gender digital divide. But those aren't the women that are going to be buying the phones and connectivity at the same time. So we need to figure out where all the pieces are, how to stop um, 
calling it the gender digital divide and get into sort of granular, you know, what we're actually talking about. So this is a call for the small data machine to feed the big data machine. Um, I'm going to leave with this quote, which was from one of our Women Connect projects in northern Nigeria, where we worked with conservative clerics, um, heads of households, and uh, gender scholars, et cetera, to come up with a program that actually got fathers excited about um, their daughters and wives uh, using the internet. And it was just one of those things where we had to find exactly what social norms we needed to push on as the levers. Uh, we needed to work with the various stakeholders and power holders in the community. And what we ended up with were, you know, a, a set of families across Kano, Nigeria, that had previously not let uh, their female family members use any sort of technology. And now we have a husband that is buying phones for his, his, his wife and children. So um, I do think it's possible to always find that compelling use case, but it's hard. It requires social scientists. And again, it's a societal intervention. So I will stop with that. I will leave my email. Um, I love talking about this, as you can probably tell. And um, let's, let's dialogue at any time. Uh, Revy Sterling at DAI.com. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Claire Sipthorpe, who runs the Connected Women, Connected Societies, and Accessibility team at GSMA. Hi, it's so great to be here. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Claire Sibthorpe. I'm the head of uh, Connected Women, Connected Society, and Assistive Tech at GSMA. Um, we're the Mobile Industry Association, and, and, and my programs, we focus very much on um, uh, gender data. Um, so this session, as has been said, is looking at gender data, which is an issue we're super passionate about. I mean, data is absolutely critical to measuring progress and driving action. And the reality is um, that there just isn't enough gender segregated data. As Revy highlighted it just now, I mean, there's so much data we still need to collect and, and have. And so despite efforts by us and other stakeholders, there's much more we need to do. And it's really important, without this data, um, the gender gaps and differences are being are being masked, and there's a lack of understanding of the reason of these gender gaps. Um, we also don't have the evidence to inform policies and actions that, that we require to address the gender gap. So it's an issue that we at GSMA take very, very seriously, and we're very data-driven in our work. Without the data, we can't inform uh, and support efforts to tackle the mobile gender gap. Um, this data has helped our mobile operator partners successfully reach millions of women driving digital and financial inclusion in low and middle income countries. Um, but I've been asked to speak a little bit about um, the mobile uh, uh, gender gap today. Um, and uh, let me talk to, first of all, I'll show you, you know, which, um, and specifically mobile, which I think is absolutely critical. Um, given the proliferations of mobile phones in the world, and I think at the time of COVID now, the huge reliance on mobile um, and the fact that the majority of the world's population access um, the internet and, and many other services through mobile, it's really important. So maybe start by talking a little bit about um, what we're doing to address the gender gap. Um, so we have our annual uh, mobile gender gap report, which looks at the scale of the gender gap in low middle income countries and mobile access and use and the barriers and how these are changing over time. It's using a nationally representative uh, surveys and we've been doing it for a number of years, which is really, uh, which allows us also to do some trend analysis. We also do a lot of deep dives into key issues. So key issues where we think that there's a lack of data and where we believe that having that data will help drive action. So we've done, for example, I've highlighted here some work around triggering mobile internet for women, we've looked at addressing um, women's mobile safety concerns and a whole range of issues. But it's also not just about our data. We need data from everybody else. We need many people to tackle this. So we've also been developing tools to increase the availability and use of gender data. So for example, we have our um, gender analysis toolkit, which allows mobile operators to predict the gender of their customer base. It's a big, it can be a big challenge because often men, for example, might register, um, might purchase a phone on behalf of their wives or daughters. So the phone is registered in a, in a um, man's name, but the user is a woman. So this uses machine learning to kind of predict and understand you know, who the user is. We've also created a methodology for how you can analyze uh, data. Uh, from a gender lens again to you know to understand because only by knowing the gender of your customers can you possibly um, really understand what the size of issue is and how you can address it. So um, we do a lot of work in this area but there's a lot more done and I'm now going to maybe move over and say, say a little bit of what the data is saying. So 
Um, not a big surprise, but there's a persistent gender gap. Um, this slide, for example, shows the gender gap in mobile internet today. So the good news is that 50% of the women in low and middle income countries are using mobile internet. So that's really an important milestone. And it's great to see that there's such uptake in this been growing uptake over many years, the number of years, but there's still a substantial gender gap. This slide shows the difference between 2017 and 2019. So you can see that at the moment, um, women are 20% less likely to use mobile internet than men um, in low middle income countries, but it's, it's also declining. It's been declining. Um, our data shows that it was been down from, for example, 27% in 2017. Majority of the closure has actually been driven by South Asia, which is also the region where we see the biggest gender gap um, and still remains biggest, but also there's been some progress. Um, it was again down from 67% in 2017 to 51% to, uh, in 2019. This is driven a lot by the dynamics in the market. It's a region where, uh, for example, data has become more affordable in many of the South Asian countries, which has really driven this reduction. But this is just one data point, I think, and I think it's also Trevi's point where we need to look at a range of data. So we use, obviously, it's not a, a linear uh, process, but we have a kind of framework that we use to, to high level to look at um, what is the sort of journey people take and what are the barriers at different stages of the journey um, and how those barriers change in importance. And again, it's really important from a data perspective that we have consistent data that we're able to track this over time to really understand the changes that are happening. Um, so you can see that, you know, we look at, for example, ownership, the mobile phone ownership gap has not, um, has basically remained very persistent, hasn't really changed very much. So those who are not, uh, don't have mobile, it's taken them a long time to reach it. Um, there's a big gap in smartphone, there's a 20% gap in smartphone ownership. Um, when we see there are different barriers and the arrows show whether the barriers changed, increased or decreased in terms of importance over um, the, uh, in the last year or so. And we're seeing again, what's interesting, I think, which data also highlights is that there are um, big changes. So there are some changes. So enhanced affordability remains the biggest gap, a biggest barrier for mobile phone ownership um, and uh, uh, particularly smartphones. Um, but also you can see that, and with uh, mobile internet adoption, it's skills and literacy is a big issue. But you can also see that uh, things like, um, uh, some of the things like increased, there's a, awareness is growing, relevance is decreased as a barrier. Um, things like safety and, and security issues have, uh, are increasing and have, uh, have gone up and in, 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 uh, emerged as issues. Um, but I think I also want to mention something also that Revy mentioned, which is around social norms. It's not, you know, social norms is a huge issue. So actually what we've done is because we have so many years of data and we have a lot of, of, of data points, we started to try and this year, we've recently just published something to look at the issue of social norms, um, whether just being a woman makes a difference. And we found that it does. So if you hold, if even if women in low and middle income countries had the same levels of education, income, literacy, and employment as men, there would still be a gender gap, which is indicating that some of those harder to measure, and we've quantified that, and we have just published something on that, but it's those harder to measure things like discrimination, social norms are really making a difference, and we can't ignore those much things that are also much harder to measure. Um, so I'm now, uh, so just to kind of maybe wrap up a little bit, which is that, um, to flag that just really, um, just to highlight, um, that it's women's access and use of mobile and the barriers they face really vary depending on a range of contextual factors. Um, so again, as Ravi said, we, we can't just look at the big picture. We also have to look at the micro level. We have to understand the different local contexts and issues. Um, mobile is also a very fast changing environment. The way in which people are using mobile, the opportunities about barriers and challenges are evolving. So we need to have, be constantly collecting uh, gender disaggregated data to understand the issues and also the local contexts relevant to women's access and use of mobile. And there's a, um, you know, a lot to be done. Um, it's really important. We need to invest in demand side data. Um, we need to really understand this issue and the opportunities. Um, and so there needs to be investment by stakeholders in, in collecting this data at local and national levels. Um, and we also, there's obviously opportunities for, for private sector to, to be um, looking at the data that they have. Um, we have seen very much firsthand in my program, the Connective One program, just how much data can make a significant impact. Um, and, you know, we, 
we feel that it's really it's, it's really important that, that sort of gender data is an issue that really does need to be prioritized. And when that data exists, and there's such a lack of this data, but when it is is this, we see that it's being used. And it's being used very effectively, and it's being used in making a difference. So I just would like to call out to everybody to please collect more data, share it, make it public. Um, there is a lot of issues and and um, still to be unearthed in this space. Um, and so we, we don't all need to do this and, and it is used. We at GSMA um, not just use our own data, but we are constantly consuming everybody else's data as well. So um, please, do, please do prioritize this. So thank you everybody for listening. And um, uh, we, if you want to find out more about our data or our activities, feel free to um, reach out. We have a newsletter, get in touch with our website. We're happy to, uh, to share everything that we do have and to, to have any further discussions on this. Thank you. And I'm now delighted to hand over to Emily Curry Pryor, who is the Executive Director of Data2x. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to our hosts for this conversation and also to the previous panelists for their comments. It's so exciting to hear the amount of energy that exists for gender data and in closing gender data gaps, not only the kind of information that we need to have and that we need to collect in the first place, but also a real commitment to using that gender data for change. It's incredibly important and it's an honor to be here today. My name is Emily Corey Pryor and I'm Executive Director of 2016. And I'm going to talk a bit today about the work that Data2x has been doing uh, to strengthen both the production and use of gender data and also to, wear some, to, to share some of our work on big data. So as previous speakers have also highlighted, there are persistent data gaps related to the gender digital divide. And those knowledge gaps really exist uh, across domains. And so since our inception in 2013, Data2x has been working to uncover those gaps, monitor those gaps, and ultimately to close them. We work and function as both a technical and an advocacy platform uh, focused on improving the quality and availability and usability of gender data worldwide to make a practical difference in the lives of women and girls. And I wanna pause on this point um, because part of what's exciting to me about this session today and about so many things over the last you know, year or so is, is just the observation that you know, when we started in 2013, Gender data was a term that was understood in very specific technical communities, but it was not something that was in general conversations about development. Gender equality was known about, of course, um, and data and statistics were known about in specific communities, but there was really not a whole lot of, of connection of those two functions um, and of understanding the ways that they interrelated with each other. So um, we're really happy about that and excited about the energy and momentum and the commitment that we're seeing from the international community to really um, taking up gender data as a major issue that we all need to work together to, to fix. So at Data2x, we have two key functions. The first is to build the case and to mobilize action for gender data. That's a big part of what we do is trying to explain to people, of course, what gender data is and why you should care about it. And then the second, uh, one of the second things that we do is really working on um, how we can strengthen production of gender data in very specific cases, right? So what are those gaps and what survey producers um, or stakeholders do we need to work with to make measurable change? So this includes you know, identifying and bringing together the right partners to tackle specific gender data gaps, as well as stimulating relevant research in new fields such as digital data or big data. And um, we've actually had a, a big data program, a big data and gender program since about 2014. And I, I say that because, you know, again, thinking back of the history of Data2x since, since starting it, um, when we were at those early stages, the conversations around, there was certainly a lot of conversations around big data and development and, you know, a lot of excitement around the potential that big data held for, uh, for development. But there were not a lot of conversations around whether or not big data could be utilized for generating a greater amount, um, a deeper amount, uh, a more temporal amount of gender insights. And so that was really one of the things that we wanted to set out to, to prove or disprove and really understand uh, what the potential was. So the first phase of our work was from 2015 to 2017, and we funded some small scale 
pilot projects to essentially assess you know, how various types of digital data could be used to provide insights on women and girls. And we found four promising applications for geospatial, for credit card, mobile phone, and social media data. And so once we got to that point um, and, 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 and put all of that information into one place, then we wanted to go you know, on a next step. We've confirmed um, at this point, yes, big data had significant potential for filling gender data gaps. And so what we decided to do was to launch a second phase of research, which began in 2017. And really the purpose of this was to set out to find applications that were ready to scale. So we put out this challenge to researchers all over the world and asked um, uh, people to submit rigorous and multi-stakeholder projects that could provide insights for gender equality and that could be feasibly replicated at a national scale. So this resulted, uh, as you see here on the screen, this, there were actually 10 different projects that came out of this that involved 29 researchers and 20 institutions in eight countries. And the projects used a wide range of data sources that uh, you can just see here on, on the screen. Uh, the challenge grant winners ranged from academia to international organizations and governments and civil society. Um, so it was a great uh, cross-section of, of organizations who worked on this. And because the topic of, of this conference is on big data and agriculture, I'm just going to give one example from, from this work um, that might be particularly relevant. So one of the studies um, from this, this batch of, of uh, gender and big data challenge work was a study from the Flowminder Foundation, who probably several of you have worked with before. Um, and this study combined geolocated survey data with satellite imagery and mobile phone data to map out three key gendered indicators at a very high spatial resolution. And one of the indicators in, uh, is the percentage of women engaged in agricultural livelihoods. And so it, there's two panels on here. So panel A, um, as you see here, this is from the survey data and it's very coarse grained. So we only have information aggregated across entire provinces, which, you know, as we all know, makes policy development and implementation tailored to the local context that Ravi was talking about earlier, it makes that pretty difficult. Um, if you look at panel B, combining survey data with geospatial and cell phone data, uh, that allowed us to create a much higher resolution, allow the Flowminder Foundation, our partners, a, a much higher resolution picture of the same indicator. And so you see that, um, of course, in, in panel B. Um, so that was just one example from, our, from, from this latest round of work. But one of the things that we did in this last round was to try to put together, okay, from that first phase we had in you know, 2015 to 2017 and putting that together with the last couple of years um, of work in these, these additional pilot projects, what have we learned overall? And I think there's several um, important lessons from this. I won't read them all um, verbatim, but I think you know, this first one seems very obvious <laughs> that digital data offers unique insights. Um, but I don't think, I, I think that that's sort of part of the point why we put it in there, right, is that we needed, we as a community um, needed to find ways to come together to really prove that out, right, and to say we're actually going to study this and understand this. We're not going to have gender as some kind of unintended outcome of larger projects. Let's see what happens if it's an intended outcome and if we actually try to understand how we can utilize these new data sources. For, um, for, for better sources of gender data and insights um, into people's lives. This second piece um, I think is also really important and this is the idea of how do we combine, how do we highlight the complementarity of digital data and big data sources with traditional data? And I think that that's very important because um, I think that it's very key to not look at this as some sort of war between data science and statistics, <laughs> that this is actually understanding and valuing all of the different um, tools that we have at our disposal and finding better ways to, to work together and to bring those systems together. Um, the third piece really gets us to thinking about, the third and the fourth actually, really um, gets us to, um, to thinking about power. Um, and I think what I would say overall is that, is that first of all, we all know, I, I, hopefully everybody listening to this is, is thinking this way, that one of the things, one of the big challenges that exists is that 
there is a challenge with the bias that is, you know, is, is already in our data sets. The reason data 2x exists, right, is because there's been a historic bias in the data that exists for um, guiding policy and programmatic change. And that is certainly true in terms of thinking about how um, digital data um, and things like algorithms can be using data sets that exist um, to further and to even accelerate existing, um, existing inequalities. And so we really need to think about and correct for, for those areas of bias. And we also need to remember that when we're talking about data, who data is about, how data is being used, that is a conversation about power. Um, and so what needs to be critical in any of the work that we do on, on gender and big data is absolutely considering the privacy of the people with whom we're working and how to make women and girls, of course, more central in these discussions. Um, so the last piece I think that I would um, say here is that, you know, this is really only a first step, um, I think, in, in how we work on um, closing the, the gender digital divide. Um, and I think that um, there's really a, a moment now that we're having in this current global health context that we're navigating that with COVID-19, that we have this as kind of a key test of this gender, this gender digital divide. And I think it was Claire who was, who was talking about this as well. And this is, you know, I think a test for us to think about our willingness to either let that divide um, and, and worsen, or if we close this gap and ensure really more equal access to ICT. And so I think that the first step to closing this gap is to understand it using both big data and traditional data sources. And, um, and I think that if we can think about that more broadly and find ways to figure out how we can make our current data systems more actionable um, and more responsive to the communities that we're trying to reach, and I think if we can do that by working together with everyone who's on this panel, as well as all the people who are watching, um, I think that we have a really um, exciting future ahead of us. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm so pleased to introduce our next colleague, Marcelo Teasler, who's Senior Advisor at KIT Royal Tropical Institute. Okay, so good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us in this uh, online uh, um, meeting. I'm very happy to be uh, having a seat this, at this uh, session, and I am uh, feel overwhelmed by the knowledge and uh, expertise of our speakers. Uh, I am Marcelo Tisler. I'm a senior advisor at the Royal Tropical Institute, and for the past few years, I've been working as the uh, I've been uh, working as the liaison uh, for the gender platform towards the big data platform. So I'll be talking a little bit about the work that we've been doing the past uh, a few years. So uh, in this, uh, here are a few uh, uh, links for you to check later if you want, specifically from the gender part platform towards uh, big data and a blog that talks a lot about using data to close gender gaps. And in, the, in this uh, connection between the two platforms, we are working a few projects and I highlight here three of them and I'll talk more about one of them. So one of them is the what we call the 100 questions projects where we try to make like a core set of household uh, questions uh, to ask if you're asking uh, questions in the context of agriculture for development. And you can see here there's a blog post about it and there's more the more proper uh, report is a second link so you can read about it and we collaborated with the gender uh, view for, for this, this set. There's also a, a research paper that we're still uh, wrapping up, so you, I cannot share any uh, results with you yet, but they will be coming soon. And uh, we look specifically at uh, if we can use call detail records uh, to provide insights into women empowerment. So that actually builds a lot in the work that was mentioned before. So this builds a lot on the on the gender analysis and identification toolkit, and uh, was a work together with uh, uh, Data Dauber Insight and uh, Kit, uh, IFPRI, and uh, SIAT. And today I'll be talking mostly about the finability of gender data sets. And uh, here there's a few links for you if you want to read uh, later. There are a few blog posts, one from the gender uh, platform, one from the big data platform, and the last link is the full uh, report. So um, uh, we always want data to be uh, fair. And uh, fair, if you haven't heard of that yet, is uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I'm not going to go into details about all this because I'm pretty sure Meda will talk briefly about it. 
uh, the, the lovely speaker coming after me, when this project is, is specifically about definability of the data set. So once you have data that can be used for gender research, how can you find it? How can you make this visible? Uh, so what, what happens here is that we do, uh, I, I did a simple exercise, right? So I asked a lot, uh, uh, knowledgeable experts, so general experts, and said, okay, from the CG systems, uh, from data which is already open and published, uh, can you give me a list of general data sets? So which are the, the good ones that, that, you, that you know, that you can use and you can access? And then we compile a list of these and we got a list of uh, uh, roughly 60 uh, general data sets uh, that were told to me by the general experts, this is uh, general data sets. And I said, okay, now suppose I am just a researcher and I actually do not have close contact with all these other researchers and I just want to go to to place on the internet a catalog and I just want to find these data sets. So how could I do that? So I, I just started searching uh, like gender, or women, female, and then my, my question was, well, would I actually get something that resembles this list that was provided or not? And the result was quite interesting. I'm not going to go into all the details now, and you can read it into the, uh, into the uh, data sets. But the conclusion is that, of course, there are a few of them that you find, but there are things that show up in the, uh, in the, in the search queries, which are actually not listed by these experts. And there were things that were listed by these experts that do not show up in the queries, which means you're making this huge effort to make your data open and accessible to everybody, and no one can find it. So, of course, it's a, it's a great uh, loss uh, potential. Uh, to give a little a bit of an idea, for example, one of the things that I did is like, uh, just look at the keywords, right? Because, of course, the, uh, the search goes into the, into the, uh, into the keywords. And, and the keywords will, will see, you see, for example, of course, gender is one of the most uh, common keywords. But you also have the WEA, and you have uh, the Women Empowerment in Agriculture Index spelled in a different way. And you have Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index spelled in a different way. So just by putting your keywords in a very uh, uh, non-organized way, you make it difficult to be found. So, so um, a, a key take takeaway from, from that is that uh, it's very simple, but just like make sure that you include the word gender in your description. Make sure that you use keywords to highlight the content of your data. Uh, if you're using uh, uh, methodologies and, uh, and methods that, you, that you're familiar with, make sure to agree with your colleagues how is the common way to post it to make it easy to find. Uh, there are also other things that like, for example, uh, I was quite surprised that when I was doing the search, I couldn't find the keyword sex disaggregated data in any of these general data sets. And this is quite striking because it's one of the key things that we want, right? Because you could think that you have basically two um, uh, a starting point of view. So you can have a gender researcher who is trying to find for another gender data set. And by this, I mean a data set that was uh, derived from a research project which had a strong gender focus. So you're trying to find out what other people are doing. But sometimes you actually just want to go and see what other things people are doing that can actually be uh, useful for me as a gender researcher, but it was not actually initially designed to be a gender research. And knowing that I have, for example, sex disaggregated data or intra-household disaggregated data is quite important. So you could also ask your colleagues to make sure that you use that. So, uh, so the, just to, to finalize this, the, like the really low hanging fruit. So I, I like to think like what are extremely easy things that you can do that will really increase uh, tremendously uh, the usability and the findability of your data. So a simple and strong takeaway is just use the right keywords. So I agree with your colleagues and discuss and think which are the important keywords. Make sure, of course, the word gender is mentioned because if you don't make sure the word gender is hard for you to find this one. Include the sex disaggregated data or other uh, data uh, descriptions that are important for that. Uh, avoid different spellings of things because you will just make the, the search more difficult. And of course, try to be a bit more specific, right? So, so we, uh, we know that it's about gender research, but what about? Like, it's about uh, socioeconomic uh, barriers, it's about access to mobile phones. And if you can be a bit more specific uh, with that, you can make your, uh, the reusability of your data much, uh, much stronger. So I'll, I'll stop for now and uh, I'll just hand over to, to, uh, to Meda, who has 300 hats. Today she will be using, I think, one of those 
related to, to garden, so she will also be talking about uh, partly about uh, definability of data. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Maida Davari, and I'm a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, and uh, I also lead the organized module of the uh, Big Data Platform. Uh, which is all about organizing data, which is why I'm talking about enhancing the discovery and the impact of gender data. Uh, most of what I'm talking about, of course, relates to um, research data. Uh, so it's a little bit of a departure from some of the, uh, what the speakers have been talking about earlier. Um, I'm just showing you a quick uh, view here uh, of Guardian. The, the, the data portal of uh, CGIR's big data platform that includes data assets from CGIR as well as a number of other key stakeholders in the agricultural domain. Uh, to discover data on gender, you would, as Marcelo said, uh, use uh, as many keywords as possible in this search and make sure that you're actually using the OR connector and not the AND connector. And this is true for any repository or uh, library catalog. When you do this kind of search, you can see you get a lot of publications and data sets. So there's quite a bit out there to be discovered. It, you just have to get at it um, in, in ways that make sense. Um, to enhance discovery and use of gender data, what are we suggesting? Uh, Marcelo referred to some of this. Uh, what, what we're talking about here is, is making sure that you use robust research methodologies. Some of the earlier speakers referred to that. Um, to, to be able to collect sex or gender disaggregated data, um, make sure that you're using digital data collection tools wherever possible, standardized surveys and terms, um, to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing, calling it the same thing so that we can recognize it later the same thing. Um, and then uh, the gender data that's anonymized as required to, for, for privacy considerations uh, should still be shared openly or as openly as possible, um, and of course made fair. Um, fairness is making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, as Marsford. Um, and, and we have um, we've de generated guidance for this. So you can visit the URL here to find the guidance and, and be able to make your data more fair. So what else can you do? Um, again, this was referred to earlier, using a consistent metadata schema. For CGIR centers, we have the CG Core metadata schema. I've, I've shown you a screenshot here from that. Uh, it's openly available. There's a link available at the bottom there. Please go there, check it out. Um, you can certainly use it. Um, and for the keywords, make sure that you annotate as richly as possible using gender, women, female, sex dis disaggregated, etc. Um, I think Emily referred to location information as well, or maybe it was Claire, I can't remember, but uh, you, you should try to annotate as richly as possible if location data is important, as I imagine it is. Um, make sure you, you, you put that in, uh, geolocations as well as uh, name, place, place names. Here's an example of a screenshot. This is a screenshot that's taken from the IFPRI Dataverse, in fact, um, for uh, a search that I did on, on gender and women, two keywords, and I got a number of different data sets. Uh, but what I want to point out to you is the keywords. Uh, the, the, the keyword gender and women have been used here uh, for, as keywords as well as uh, topic classification terms. And all of that helps this data be found much more easily. So I'm just sort of reinforcing that point uh, with this slide. Another piece of this is using standards to annotate uh, not only the keywords, but also data variables. And here you can use controlled vocabularies. Agrivoc is one of them. Um, I think that was also in Marcelo's uh, um, presentations. Uh, presentation, but I, but I also want to focus on, on ontologies. I won't get into what an ontology is, but it is the, the de facto standard right now for uh, annotating data variables. Um, here I'm showing you another uh, controlled vocabulary that you can use besides Agrivoc, which is very, very rich, and this is the medical subject heading terms. Uh, a lot of this might be useful for those doing research in nutrition, for instance, or in, uh, you know, looking at uh, a gender bias uh, in, in clinical terms, which, which is also very important. Weight, uh, you know, girl, girl children weights versus boy children weights, for instance. Um, so so this, is, this is another vocabulary you can use. In terms of ontologies, to, to, to annotate actual variables within data sets, um, you can go to the ontology lookup service or OLS. Um, there's a lot of ontologies here. When you do the search uh, for, for data, you get a huge number of ontologies to choose from. And I know this is a little overwhelming. Um, and I'll get to how you can sort of 
manage this. <laughs> I just wanted to make you aware of this. Um, there's also the, the SDGIO or this, uh, the, the Sustainable Development Goal Interface Ontology. So you can actually annotate your data variables and, and hook up with the, the Sustainable Development Goals in, in this way, which is quite nice as well. Lastly, in, in terms of, in, you know, the, the impact of, of gender data, you want to be able to analyze the data to, to, for it to have impact. You want to be able to, to derive insights from the data. And yet, a lot of this da data might be sensitive in terms of um, its content. So for that, uh, you can use another tool that the Big Data Platform has developed called CG Labs. The, the, the link is up there. Um, and, and here you can use this to securely exchange data because uh, underlying this is the, the Globus uh, software, which is HIPAA compliant. HIPAA is pretty much the strongest um, uh, framework for, 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 for uh, privacy uh, applicable to medical data, really. So, so this really works um, very stringently and robustly. Feel free to check that out as well in your, in your large scale analyses, for instance. So just wrapping up, um, where do I find the tools to enhance discovery and impact? I've, I've presented a lot of stuff here very quickly, uh, but if you want to go to guardian.bigdata.cgr.org and look at our data manage, management toolkit, kit, you'll be able to click on that uh, and you'll see uh, a number of resources there, uh, data gathering, but, but focus on the data curation ones perhaps. Um, you can see the FAIR data workflow and upload, uh, which will enable you to actually use some of these tools, the, 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 the metadata schema, the consistent metadata schema, as well as the ontologies, uh, without necessarily knowing what they are. It makes it easy for you to do this. Uh, there's also tools to check data for personally identifiable information in keeping with the sort of the privacy and ethics um, uh, uh, part of what we're doing here. So if you need help, uh, check out these links in addition to the ones I already provided. But the, the, the message I want to leave you with is that tools and data information managers cannot do it all. This also involves capacity enhancement and culture change. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for the presentations today. Audience members are encouraged to ask questions and follow up with panelists through the chat box or through the information they provided to be in touch. Thanks for joining.